to say a few words about um, the challenges of trustworthy computing, or at least the way I see them. And this is uh, obviously going to be very controversial, and for that reason, uh, John McCune, Brian Parno, Adrian Perig, Amit Basudevan, and John Wei Zhu should not be blamed for these views, but they are co-conspirators in this uh, endeavor. So uh, my outline is very short. First, I'd like to talk about the axioms, in quote, uh, of security and human usable security. Uh, secondly, about the relevance or irrelevance of fashionable security architectures uh, to trustworthy computing, such as traditional virtualization methods, the traditional security kernels, and the like. Uh, and then I'd like to uh, issue a challenge for trustworthy computing, namely relevance. Uh, that is, relevance to practice. Uh, in particular, I'm going to emphasize two things. One is that uh, the trustworthy computing base uh, has to be immutable. In other words, has to be as stable as the hardware itself in order to make a, a difference in practice. And secondly, that uh, uh, all the security properties of the trusted base have to be understandable to humans, not just to developers human users, not just the developers. Without these two things, uh, trustworthy computing will see much of the same fate as trustworthy computing has seen for the last uh, roughly 30 years, meaning it won't be used. Um, so uh, let me start out by pointing out what I consider to be the axioms of insecurity. So the first axiom, and by the way, axiom in quotes, these are observations, of course, which are expected to be true for a long time. So when I say always, I mean uh, 15 plus years. And of course, that's going to be past my retirement age, so you won't be able to blame me. Um, anyway, so there will always be bugs and operator errors that will lead to security vulnerabilities. And these bugs and operator errors will be taken advantage of by adversaries who are always willing to exploit the vulnerability caused by these bugs. Uh, so we'll live with adversaries forever. Uh, there will always be rapid innovation in information technology. And uh, what this means is that there will be a rapid change, as we've witnessed already, to the boundaries of the trusted computing base, whatever that is uh, and however that is defined. Uh, the immediate implication is that uh, unless we do something about it, we will have a high degree of uncertainty of assurances in the trusted base. So unless we really architect system differently, this is going to be with us. Uh, the next uh, implication is that uh, of this rapid innovation is that um, applications, not uh, operating systems and applications, will. Uh, comprise components of diverse provenance, uh, which means that at best we have non-uniform security assurances because different components are going to be provided by different suppliers, uh, which use, uh, and, and, and the, the suppliers will use uh, different assurance techniques, probably possibly uh, non-uniform and might not even be assurance techniques that might not be uh, com compatible or composable with each other. Uh, lastly, there will be more attack surfaces. If uh, you build applications out of different components, well, the components that are uh, in the interior, if you want, of the application will still have an interface, uh, which might be discovered from uh, the outside adversary, and, and the outside adversary might be able to attack whatever flaws those internal components would have. So we are not talking about a single application interface, but multiple interfaces, including interfaces of the components used in the application. Uh, finally, there will always be large complex systems whose security is not fully understood by most users. And in fact, to quote uh, Butler Lamson uh, in a different context, um, I quote him by saying that um, in the uh, software area, only giants survive. Um, in other words, what you will see now, what you see now in terms of giants, uh, you'll see in the future as well. There may be different giants, but there'll be giants nevertheless. So 
Um, so with this in mind is uh, what, uh, uh, what do you mean by usable, what do I mean by usable security? And what, uh, what, are true, what, what is true about users? One is uh, that users understand only very simple security mechanisms and policies. Uh, in other words, if you do something very complicated or even moderately complicated, uh, it's a lost cause. Uh, users won't understand how to set ACLs for fairly complex policies. They won't be able to understand how to set firewall policies, again, if they are very complex or even moderately complex. And they will not know, uh, in general, how to uh, set and use and administer fine-grained mechanisms. In other words, fine-grained security, which is what we are all after for the last 40 years in the academia, right? I mean, we want more fine-grained security. The more fine-grained, the better. Uh, of course, it turns out that that's a fallacy. Uh, users cannot cope with fine-grained security. Um, that's basically an observation that we've had for, for the last 30 plus years. Um, complexity should be introduced only increment incrementally, uh, and of course, uh, the less, the better. Uh, the next uh, axiom of usable security is that uh, there has to be a maximum expectation for what a user can do. And that expectation should probably limit it to what's called simple separation of assets. Uh, human users typically separate assets or understand the separation of assets when it comes to money. Uh, so we all understand that when we deal with our bank, or uh, when we deal with our uh, uh, pension funds and our investments, uh, we, we understand that that's sensitive material. It's really our money. Uh, and we can separate those actions from the actions that we take when we browse the Internet. We might even be able to understand that some of our, health, our own healthcare assets uh, are fairly sensitive. Uh, some of us might not care, but some of us do. And we uh, do understand, particularly those uh, using in, uh, in the defense area, that there are defense and intelligence assets that have to be separated from uh, internet browsing. Now, you might wonder why um, would you put uh, access to intelligence uh, assets uh, in the same sentence with internet browsing? Well, uh, if you cut off uh, the access to the internet of the CIA, probably 75 of the CIA employees will be out of business. Uh, so, so essentially, uh, the idea that, uh, that assets, access to assets would coexist with uh, accesses to non-assets uh, is probably something that we have to assume for, for a long time. Uh, we just have to be able to separate them and to keep them separate. So basically what I think uh, this says is that uh, we need a high level of security for few types of transactions and data. Um, other, for other assets, we really need freedom of choice and unrestricted access to the Internet, which, by the way, is not negotiable anymore because the Internet now is uh, not far away from us. It's certainly not in our backyard anymore. It's actually with us. It's on our smartphones, our laptops, um, in our controls of physical plant, and so on. 